morning, everybody. Uh, we are pleased to have Rachel Somerville to speak for, to us today. Rachel is an expert on the evolution and formation of galaxies and supermassive black holes. She got her PhD from UC Santa Cruz and over the years had held positions in the University of Michigan, Max Planck Institute for Astronomy, Johns Hopkins University and Space Telescope Science Institute. She is currently a distinguished professor at Rutgers University and a leader of the Galaxy Formation Group at the Center for Computational Astrophysics at Flatiron Institute. So to the audience, if you have any question, please use the raise hand function or notify me in the chat and I'll find the right time for you to ask, for you to ask your question. So with that, uh, welcome Rachel and please take the virtual floor. Thank you very much, Jeffrey and Roman, and thank you to all of you for inviting me to speak with you today. Um, I very much wish that I could be there in person and see all of you out in front of me, but I'm extremely grateful that uh, throughout the crises in the world today that we are still able to do our work and to share and discuss our work. So today I'd like to tell you about a project called Simulating Multiscale Astrophysics to Understand Galaxies to Overcome the Multiscale Challenge of Modeling Galaxy Formation in a Cosmological Context. So the grand challenge for both cosmologists and people who study galaxy formation is really to understand a complete picture of how the universe evolves from the initial conditions that we can probe with the cosmic microwave background to today's large scale structure and galaxy population. And one way to think of this puzzle is how the universe gets from these very simple initial conditions, which are nearly Gaussian, nearly scale free, to the amazing complexity of the walls, filaments and voids that we see in the large scale structure and the galaxies with this incredible diversity of different structure uh, and properties. So just for, for those of you who don't work on galaxies and think about them every day, I want to remind everyone that if we look at high resolution images of individual galaxies, every galaxy is special. Every galaxy is completely unique, a bit like people. Um, and yet, of course, they have broad characteristics by which we can categorize them. We speak of disk galaxies and elliptical galaxies that have different shapes and morphologies. We see galaxies that are rapidly star forming in blue. We see galaxies that are red and dead. And one of the fascinating things about galaxies is that somehow these internal properties, their morphology and spectrophotometric properties, seem to know about the environments in which these galaxies live. So they know about the environments on scales of megaparsec, megaparsecs or tens of megaparsecs. So any theory of galaxy formation needs to not only explain the demographics of the galaxy population and, the, and its diversity, it also needs to explain these connections that we see across many orders of magnitude in scale in galaxies up into uh, large scale structure. Another puzzle of galaxies um, and one of the fascinating things about them is that in spite of the complexity of the physics that shapes galaxy properties and this amazing diversity that I was, was talking about, galaxies show these very tight scaling relations between their global properties. So many of these are probably familiar to you, the relationship between stellar mass and metallicity, between black hole, mass and bulge mass, between galaxy stellar mass and size, stellar mass and halo mass, etc. So there are many of these scaling relations which tell us um, that there's some physical process telling galaxies that they should lie along these relatively tight relations. And with observations that can resolve the internal structure of galaxies, for example, with integral field unit spectrographs, we now know that many of these scaling relations have both resolved and global manifestations. So you see the same kind of scaling relation if you look at a piece of a galaxy or if you look at a whole galaxy. So an example shown here 
is the relationship between stellar mass or stellar mass surface density and star formation rate or star formation rate surface density. And this is one of the relations that is seen both in individual patches of galaxies and in whole galaxies. So this connection uh, between local scales and galactic scales seems to be imprinted in the scaling relations. And one of the questions is how this is connected all the way up to halo scales and to cosmological scales. So one of the motivations of the work that I will be telling you about is looking forward over the next decade when we will have the Vera Rubin Observatory scanning the sky, um, obtaining samples of billions of galaxies across the sky. We'll have the Nancy Grace Roman Telescope doing sub arc second res resolution imaging over thousands of square degrees of the sky. And we'll also have telescopes like the James Webb Telescope and extremely large telescopes on the ground, which can study the internal structure and kinematics of galaxies to high resolution and, and with high precision. So we will have this amazing um, collection of data, again, spanning huge, um, huge range of scales that we would like our models to be able to confront and understand and interpret. So we have a fairly good broad brush picture of how we think galaxies form and evolve within a cosmological context, which again, you're probably all quite familiar with. So um, we know that inflation seeds the initial density perturbations, which grow by gravitational instability and form this cosmic web of filaments, walls, and voids, form gravitationally bound structures called dark matter halos. But then it gets a bit more murky. So we think that gas can accrete into those dark matter halos where it can cool and form stars. And this occurs on scales of tens to hundreds of kiloparsecs to megaparsecs. And then that cool gas forms giant molecular clouds and can form stars. And those giant molecular clouds, which have scales of, of 10 parsecs or so, then form massive stars and supernovae, which can affect the surrounding interstellar medium through supernovae, radiation, and stellar winds. And we know, uh, or there's a, a large body of literature arguing that stellar feedback has a profound effect on galaxy properties and even on the properties of the circumgalactic and perhaps intergalactic medium. Um, there's a long list of problems that supernova feedback is in, invoked to solve. So the inefficiency of star formation on small scales in galaxies, the low baryon fractions in galactic halos, um, and indeed uh, it's needed in order to form disk galaxies and not to form uh, every galaxy with a huge bulge in the center. Um, for more detailed discussion of those arguments, you can see either of these review papers in annual reviews here. In addition, uh, so stellar feedback is very important, but it's not enough. So in order to make those red and dead galaxies, those elliptical galaxies that I showed you, which are extremely massive and surrounded by large reservoirs of, of gas that should be cooling rather rapidly, um, there's a consensus that we need feedback from supermassive black holes that reside at the centers of galaxies and can also um, produce radiation, winds, and jets. So uh, this is occurring on scales of black hole accretion disks um, or very small scale structures. So I want you to notice the range of scales here from hundreds of megaparsecs of large scale structure down to sub parsec scales where individual supernovae and black holes are actually doing their work. So because of this enormous dynamic range and because of the broad range of physical processes that are operating here, currently, if you want to simulate a cosmological volume, it is necessary to use what are called subgrid recipes to treat the processes in these red boxes here. So to treat the processes that are occurring on scales smaller than what you can resolve directly in your simulation. 
So just to sort of show you a bit uh, where the state of the art is with these cosmological simulations of galaxy formation, um, let's take a look at this diagram. So on the x-axis, we see the number of galaxies with a stellar mass above 10 to the 9, a bit of an arbitrary limit, that can be resolved, or on the top of the x-axis, the volume of the simulation that is achievable. And then on the y-axis is the baryon mass resolution. So these numbers are a bit small. This goes from 10 to the 9. So this is, this is plotted backwards. I wouldn't have done it this way. So this is coarser resolution on the bottom and finer resolution on the top. Okay. Um, and I've also overlaid here the rough sort of spatial resolution that can be achieved in these simulations, uh, which increases, of course, as the volume simulated increases. And plotted on here, and again, you may not be able to, to read these little tiny labels, are a whole bunch of simulations from the literature, many of which, again, you may be familiar with. So if we want to do very high resolution simulations um, that might have some hope of beginning to resolve giant molecular clouds, for example, then we have to use a technique called zoom in, where we essentially simulate a single galaxy halo, one at a time. So you can see these samples are very small. Only a, a few tens of, of galaxies can be simulated. Up to the cosmological volumes, so these are the illustrious TNG simulations, um, the 50, 100, and 300 box. Other familiar simulations like Eagle are also in a, in a similar regime here. Um, and so what you can see is that as you start to get up to volumes that are you know, not even as large as the survey volumes we'd like to be able to interpret, um, the mass resolution does become quite coarse and it becomes really infeasible um, to do simulations with much larger volume with, with full hydrodynamics. So there are techniques which I will talk about a bit called semi-analytic models that don't really, try to resolve, don't really try to resolve the internal structure of galaxies at all and can do larger volumes with less detailed information about galaxies. And then at the other side of the spectrum, I'll also talk a bit about uh, simulations that can only represent a piece of a galaxy, so not, not even a whole galaxy, but which have extremely high resolution, so parsec resolution. And I also want to make a distinction um, between simulations that can resolve a relevant physical process. So let's consider, for example, resolving the full phase of the, the set of phase of a supernova blast wave um, versus these sort of intermediate simulations, which resolve some of the relevant processes, but still must use subgrid recipes for some of them. So I'll call these semi-resolved versus cosmological simulations where really the, that full range of, of processes has to be treated with, with subgrid. So this is an incomplete list of the processes that currently require subgrid treatment in large volume cosmological simulations. You can see this is quite long and I've probably left some things off. Um, so for today, because this is a very huge topic, I'm going to mostly focus on uh, stellar feedback and how stellar feedback may be able to drive large scale outflows and affect galaxies and the circumgalactic medium. So let me give you an example of how this process of stellar feedback and stellar driven winds is frequently <clears throat> excuse me, currently implemented in cosmological simulations. I'm going to take the example of the illustrious and illustrious TNG series of simulations, but of course there are many other simulations out there. So, uh, and this technique goes back to works like Springle and Hernquist, Oppenheimer and Dave, et cetera. So what we do is we randomly select a star forming gas particle and we say, okay, you get turned into a wind particle which then for some period of time, the hydrodynamic forces are switched off for that particle. So it still feels gravity, but it does not feel the hydrodynamic forces anymore. Until it falls below a critical density or a maximum travel time has elapsed, and then the mass, momentum, thermal energy, and metals from that particle are deposited back into the, the cell where it finds itself, um, and we say that it's recoupled. 
and the velocity, mass loading, energy loading, and metal loading of these wind particles are specified by phenomenological scalings that typically depend on the properties of the dark matter halo, so virial properties, and tunable parameters. So here's a very simple example. This is what was implemented in the original Lustre simulations. So the velocity of the wind particles was proportional to the velocity dispersion of the dark matter halo at the virial radius. And the mass loading, so mass loading, I'll, I'll speak throughout this talk about mass loading, energy loading. This is the mass outflow rate or energy deposition rate, etc., relative to a reference quantity. <clears throat> In the case of mass loading, the reference quantity is the star formation rate. So this is just assumed to be a constant, a tunable constant, divided by the wind velocity squared. Now, you can make these equations more complicated. You can put in more parameters. You can put in more bells and whistles and tune everything. And this is what's been done in subsequent um, generations of these simulations like illustrious TNG. They basically added uh, dependencies on redshift and metallicity and, and, and so forth. But the, the basic philosophy is the same. And then you look at a bunch of calibration quantities. So basically these scaling relations of galaxy properties, like I mentioned before, and you change the parameters and you see what happens. So let's just focus here on this panel, which is the stellar mass function the number per cubic megaparsec of galaxies in bins of stellar mass. And we have some observationally derived estimates of this quantity at redshift zero. And these different lines come from changing the mass loading of the winds, the, the velocity of the winds. You can also add an energy term and add thermal energy as well as kinetic energy. So they tried a whole bunch of different things and they looked at these plots and they said, eh, okay, we like, we like this set of parameters. And this, again, this is sort of the common procedure um, for these, these calibrated cosmological simulations. And when this is done, um, there are actually, it, it actually works pretty well. So many of the observed correlations between small scales and large scales that I was discussing. So for example, the morphology density relation or the correlation between quenched galaxies and their environment emerged from these simulations, although they of course were not put in. So this is a non-trivial success and these simulations have um, indisputably been incredibly useful for gaining insights into galaxy formation and evolution and, and interpreting observations. And as I mentioned, of course, you know, there's lots of other um, groups producing these large volume cosmological simulations. And this is wonderful because each group implements the subgrid recipes in a different way, um, uses a different set of observables to calibrate to. And so now we can actually compare the results of these different simulations and see if they give us the same picture or not, or in which ways they agree or disagree. So this is a comparison uh, from a, quite a few years ago now from, from this 2015 review paper of the stellar mass function, again, um, where the squares represent observational estimates and the different lines represent different cosmological hydrodynamic simulations as well as semi-analytic models. So you can see that at redshift zero, these line up very well because they were all calibrated to the same observations. Uh, most of them were not calibrated at high redshift, however, and so you can see that the lines start to spread apart. Different simulations give slightly different predictions as you go out to, to higher redshift. However, um, there are a number of possible concerns or um, serious drawbacks to this approach. And one, of course, is that if you're tuning to get a certain set of observed properties, then um, I wouldn't say that these simulations have no predictive power, but their predictive power is certainly limited or compromised. Another problem is that if we, looked at, if we look at these different simulations where the subgrid recipes have been implemented in different ways, they might produce the same prediction for, say, the stellar mass function, but vastly different predictions for the properties of the circumgalactic medium, for example, or other components that were not calibrated. So then 
you know, in the absence of observations of, of those quantities, how do we know which, which is right? Um, we could be getting the right answer for the wrong reasons. There are many, many degeneracies, of course, in this complicated set of physical processes. <clears throat> and finally, these simulations are much too computationally expensive to really rigorously explore the sensitivity to the details of the subgrid models um, or to do rigorous statistical inference or parameter fitting to, to a set of observations. We have a question from the audience, uh, Renu. Yes, go ahead, please. Rachel, so what's the typical ratio of the number of outputs that match observation to number of parameters that they use in the simulations? You mean calibration observations or, or predictions? Uh, the prediction of their match observation over the number of parameters employed. I would say it depends a bit on whether, you know, for example, you count each bin in the stellar mass function as a separate observation. You know, it's a little bit different, difficult question to answer um, precisely. I would say when you consider still the range of different implementations that there are sort of more, there's more parameter space than there are constraints at the moment. But I, th I think we can. And then the second question is, are there number of observations that no matter what you do, you cannot match? Yes. So the other thing is that some, sim I would say that none of the simulations that have been published match all of the observations. So that's also interesting, right? There's no simulation that is consistent within the error bars with all of the observations that we currently have. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay, and then an additional problem is that, of course, we often use galaxies as cosmological probes. For example, we might measure the power spectrum of galaxies and try to use this to constrain things like the nature of dark matter, um, the number of neutrinos, mass of neutrinos, etc. cetera. Um, and, but of course, this baryonic physics may affect the clustering of galaxies as well as um, the, what, which, which regions you select because they light up and are selected as galaxies. So this diagram shows the power spectrum in a simulation run with full hydrodynamics and all of these subgrid recipes relative to a simulation with only dark matter and no baryonic processes as a function of k, the wave number. And so you can see that two simulations that I showed you had basically an identical stellar mass function. Let's just take illustrious and eagle, so the green and the purple line, have vastly different effects on the clustering of matter on intermediate and large scales. So if we'd like to use um, data in these sort of intermediate quasi-linear regimes um, to learn about cosmology, it would be very nice if we understood um, the baryonic physics well enough that we don't have to marginalize over this huge range of, of different uh, possible effects. So uh, this all is motivation for um, why we started the Smaug collaboration. So we pronounce this Smaug in honor of the dragon in Tolkien. Um, and I will give special bonus points to anyone who can tell me the significance of, of the symbolism in our logo here, anyone who's not in the Smog collaboration, that is. Um, so this is co-directed by myself and Greg Bryan, and there's been a very strong involvement from people from Princeton, including Evo Stryker, Elliot Quadert, who's, I guess, now virtually there, um, Jim Stone, and Changu Kim, especially. Um, and I also want to note here um, that I decided to give a rather broad overview of the first results from the Smaug project. So I'm going to cover quite a lot of ground rather quickly um, in the rest of my talk. But um, nearly all of the papers that I'll mention here are uh, linked to from the Smaug website, which you can find here. And you can also find more information about, about Smaug at that website. Or of course, you can also ask me. 
So how, uh, what are the goals of Smaug and how does our philosophy and approach differ from the traditional one that I just outlined to you? So our ultimate goal is to try to create a direct link between the ab initio physical processes like star formation or stellar winds and observable quantities, especially propagating all the way to the space of observable cosmological probes, such as the weak gravitational lensing shear signal or galaxy power spectrum. So our approach is to design a ladder of multi-scale simulations to try to build up our understanding of how these physical processes work and interact across different scales. So to do this, we often use idealized simulations as laboratories to try to extract analytic scaling relations that can form the basis for our subgrid models rather than using um, more arbitrary or phenomenologically motivated subgrid scaling relations. And then any remaining parameters in the subgrid recipes are calibrated to the lower rung on the ladder or to some lower rung on the ladder. So simulations that have higher resolution or, and or include more explicit physics, not calibrated to get out what you want, right? Not calibrated to get out uh, an observed quantity. But then of course you can make sort of more true predictions and compare with observations and we also feel that the observational validation, which is of course critical, should be multi-probe. What I mean by that is we shouldn't just focus on the properties of stars. As much as possible, we should also try to probe um, cold, dense gas in the ISM, diffuse gas in the circumgalactic medium, um, obscured star formation, unobscured star formation. So many, as many different components of galaxies probed by multi-wavelength observations as we can, and it should be carried out as much as possible in the observational plane. So instead of comparing with stellar mass functions, we should be comparing with uh, quantities that are actually observable with proper accounting for observational selection effects and errors. So obviously this is a, this is a pretty ambitious program. Um, let me tell you about some of the first steps and first results that, um, that we've obtained. So at the core of the Smaug project is something we call Project Arkenstone. So if you know your Tolkien, you might remember that the Arkenstone was this beautiful gem, which was Smaug's very favorite uh, and precious treasure. Uh, and Project Arkenstone has been largely led by uh, Matthew Smith, who's a joint postdoc at CF CFA and CCA, and Drummond Fielding, who's a postdoc at the CCA. And the goal is to develop a manifestly multi-phase subgrid treatment of stellar driven winds and the circumgalactic medium. So really this sort of ecosystem um, of, of stellar winds and re-accretion of ejected gas in, in the circumgalactic medium that can be implemented in large volume cosmological simulations. So according to the Smaug manifesto, um, the wind launching parameters and recoupling criteria have to be based on simulations with resolved physics. So one of the bottom rungs, critical bottom rungs of our ladder in Smaug are the Tigris simulations, which probably many of you are very familiar with. Um, here's the Tigris hanging out outside of, of Peyton Hall, of course. Um, and so this framework has been developed by Evo Stryker, Changu Kim and their collaborators. Um, it's based on um, the Athena code, and these are what are sometimes called tall box, so vertically stratified um, slabs of, of gas uh, and stars, which include MHD and self-gravity, um, and typically have resolution of uh, a few parsecs to, to 10 parsecs or so, and include a long list of, of physical processes, processes here, um, critically, these simulations can resolve uh, the set-off phase of, of the supernova blast waves. And so the properties of the winds that emerge in these simulations, so this is showing density, by the way, temperature and magnetic field strength, the properties of the winds are sort of emergent from the physical processes and not, uh, not put in phenomenologically. 
So as I mentioned, um, these simulations can't represent a whole galaxy. And so uh, the Smaug collaboration, Chenggu really has done a suite of, um, of boxes representing different surface densities of gas and star formation uh, typical of different regions within the Milky Way. So you, you may see these labels R2, R4, R8, etc. So these are these patches at roughly 2 kiloparsecs, 4 kiloparsecs, 8 kiloparsecs, etc. Um, and you can see the range of, of gas surface densities represented by the initial conditions. So if we then examine um, the properties of the outflowing gas, in a slice of one of these simulations, this is the R4 simulation. What's shown here is the outflow velocity and the sound speed of the material. And so this top figure is, is density coded by the mass loading and the second panel is coded by the energy loading. So you can see several things immediately. First of all, uh, the winds are, are manifestly multi-phase, although they are mostly in this sort of hot component and cold component. There's not really much in the intermediate uh, temperature range. And they're not at all well represented by a single value of the mass loading or velocity, which is, again, what's typically been done in cosmological simulations in the past. Also important is that most of the mass is in the cold phase, while most of the energy is in the hot phase. And one of the things that this implies is that in order to properly sample both phases, you need to use uh, different resolution. You need to use smaller particles to properly sample the hot phase relative to the cold phase. So Chenggu Gu uh, in this lovely paper that was recently submitted has provided fitting functions that allows one to, to sample from these distributions in order to um, obtain prediction for the velocity and phase of, of winds. And then he's also additionally provided this result, which is the mass loading, momentum loading, energy loading, and metal loading of these winds as a function of a property that could be measured in a cosmological simulation, such as the star formation rate surface density on the scale of the, the whole box, so a few hundred parsecs, let's say. And he's presented us with these fitting functions representing the scaling relation. So this tells us how much mass is uh, coming out in one of these winds in either the cool phase or the hot phase as a function of the local environment uh, where the star forming gas is located. And he finds similar results if this is plotted as a function of other variables, these variables are all highly correlated in the Tigris simulations. We have another question. Yes, Can go I ahead, have... please. Hi, Rachel. Uh, so when you selected these boxes, did you, uh, or uh, 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 when the boxes were selected, is it only in radius? Or is the azimuthal dependence uh, not important here? So there's actually a set of approximately five parameters that determine the conditions in these boxes. So it's not just the gas surface density. Um, there's also a shear. There's also a, um, a total density. So there's, there's a set of parameters chosen for each of these, which were chosen to match uh, Milky Way conditions. And these are all uh, provided in, in this paper if you're interested in the details. OK, got it. Thank you. Yeah. OK. So, so these fitting relations basically fully specify the launching conditions um, of the winds, at least in this set of, of simulations representative of conditions in, in the Milky Way galaxy. So the other piece um, of this wind model is the interaction of the wind material with the circumgalactic medium um, and how to recouple the wind particles into the circumgalactic medium. So as the multiphase outflows interact with the CGM, um, of course, the cold dense gas is in motion relative to the hotter diffuse gas, and Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities create a radiative mixing layer. Um, and the 
uh, the physics of this radiative turbulent mixing layer largely determine how mass, energy, and momentum are exchanged between the hot and cold phases. And once again, um, this is a very hard multi-scale problem um, because in order to simulate this directly, you would need to resolve scales from the hundreds of kiloparsecs of the circumgalactic medium where these winds are, are interacting um, down to uh, subparsec scales. So uh, there was some very nice work led by Drummond Fielding in collaboration with, with Eve, uh, Greg Bryan, and Adam German, where they used um, a suite of, again, idealized simulations of radiative mixing layers to develop intuition and test an analytic model um, that provides the necessary scalings for um, the, the mass energy and momentum transfer in these radiative mixing layers. Um, and I'm noticing I'm running a bit short on time. So um, I encourage you to, to read this paper for more details. Um, but the, the basic point to take away here is that you can see that they define a set of dimensionless quantities. Um, the basically the shearing time over the cooling time, the density contrast between the cold and hot gas and the Mach number and derive an expression that is a function of those dimensionless variables. So that's shown here. And then the dots are the results um, from their suite of idealized simulations. And you can see that they agree quite well as long as they're in this sort of rapidly cooling regime where uh, this T shear over T cool is, is greater than one. So this provides us again um, with a physically motivated and calibrated scaling relation that we can now implement um, into these, these wind particles to determine when they recombine. Okay, so the status now of Project Arkenstone is that we have a, a sort of fully specified model for the wind launching and recoupling, which has been implemented within the Arepo code by Matthew Smith, and the work in progress is to carry out testing within an idealized galaxy and CGM system. Okay, so let me switch gears now a bit and talk about going up a step in scales to try to develop new tools that can simulate very large volumes um, with, with uh, again, physically calibrated methods. So you could imagine that instead of trying to track individual particles or grid cells like you do in a, in a hydrodynamic simulation, that you could just track sort of bulk movement of mass and metals as they move between different reservoirs, for example, the stars, um, ISM, CGM, IGM, et cetera, and represent those flows by a set of coupled ordinary differential equations, which are solved numerically. And so many of you may recognize that you know, this is sort of what we do in what are traditionally called semi-analytic models. They're basically sets of, of flow equations. But in traditional semi-analytic models, which of course go back to the early 90s, um, each of these terms for the flows um, in and out of different reservoirs are, again, relatively arbitrary and are tuned to match observations rather than to match um, numerical simulations. So uh, the goal of the thesis work of Viraj Pandya, uh, who's a graduate student at the University of Santa Cruz, is to develop a new framework um, using the same approach, but now we're placing the traditional flow equations with scalings that are calibrated to, to numerical simulations. So for this project, we used a suite of zoom-in simulations from the FIRE2 collaboration um, so these are kind of at the upper left corner of that diagram I showed you before. They represent single halos with masses between 10 to the 10 to 10 to the 12, and typically have baryonic mass resolution of a few hundred to a few thousand solar masses. And they have what I called semi-resolved implementations of stellar feedback. These, these simulations currently do not contain uh, black holes or, or AGN feedback. So what Viraj has done is to extract halos and merger trees from the fire simulations so that we can run semi-analytic models within the trees representing the formation history of the same galaxies that we have from fire. And then he extracts 
the global quantities like stellar mass, ISM mass, CGM mass, etc., from fire, and also the flow quantities. So how much mass is flowing in and how much mass is flowing out. And we identify these three scales. So what I'm going to call ISM is, is uh, flowing through a shell 0.1 to 0.2 times the virial radius. And then the virial shell is 1 to 1.1 times the virial radius. And then I may also talk about the turnaround radius, which is, which is twice the virial radius. And we analyzed 5 10 to the 10 solar mass halos, 5 10 to the 11, and 3 10 to the 12 solar mass halos. So what's shown here are some calibration quantities for the fire simulations shown by the circles and the crosses shown by the semi-analytic model. So this is stellar mass halo mass. You can see the agreement is reasonably good. This is the ISM mass, still okay. And this is the CGM mass. So this is the mass um, in that intermediate shell between the ISM and the virial mass. And this is off by orders of magnitude. So this is an example of you know, getting things right for the wrong reason. We can't observe this quantity directly. And so um, there's a lot of freedom for simulations to get the same answer in different ways. And so one of the things we realized when we looked at the flow quantities, so let's just look at the bottom row right now, which is the, the, the ratio between the semi-analytic model and fire, showing the rate masses flowing into the halo and into the ISM and out of the ISM and out of the halo. And what you see is that in low mass galaxies shown by the blue curves here, um, there's a lot more mass flowing in and a lot more mass flowing out. So you can see that the SAM, because it can be tuned, has compensated for too much inflow by having a lot of outflow. We have a question, Michael? Yes, go ahead, please, Michael. Hi. Um, yeah, so in those uh, scatter plots, maybe a slide back um, showing the correlations. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. yeah. So one is, are you assuming that these are deterministic relations or are you in tr putting in a scatter or how, how should we think about it? I mean, the Each, rightmost shows a, shows a large, the rightmost one shows a large range, but I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> as it were. Yes. Each, each point is a different halo, right? right? So each halo has a different formation history, which introduces some uh, of the scatter. Uh, the question of whether Numerical simulations are completely deterministic or not is an interesting one. They're not, it turns out, right? There is, a, you know, if you even run with different initial conditions, things can sure. be different by 20% sure. or so. Uh, the SAMs are pretty deterministic. That is, that is, for, you're assuming a one-to-one -one -one relation. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So the scatter okay. is mainly the scatter between halos with different formation histories, but the same mass. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Good. Okay. Great. Okay. So, so what this boils down to is that if we look at how much mass in gas is flowing into the halo compared to how much mass the dark matter halo is accreting or how fast it's growing, it's often assumed that there's a one-to-one -one relation here. So that basically gas kind of follows dark matter as it falls in. And if that were the case, we would see this gray line here, the universal baryon fraction. But instead what we see, so the black points show the measurements from fire uh, at redshift zero, the pink points show redshift two, is that especially in low mass halos, um, the baryon inflow, baryonic inflow is significantly suppressed relative to the dark matter inflow. And some of you might be thinking, oh, well, we know that. We know that a metagalactic UV background will indeed suppress um, the accretion of baryons in these low mass halos. And that effect is shown by the black line here. So according to our current understanding, of that process, it's not occurring um, with the right dependence on halo mass or at the right scale in halo mass. So what we explored was a simple model in which there's also an energy component to the winds um, so that you actually preheat the gas and prevent it from falling in. So it's a preventative rather than an ejective mode of supernova feedback. And we found that this model works only if the energy loading depends on halo mass or mass loading with this dependence here. So again, we basically just said, well, what would we need um, to make this work and perhaps improve semi-analytic models in the future? In this paper, we didn't measure what was happening in fire to see what was going on. Um, there's a new paper in preparation where Viraj is 
reanalyzing the massive fi the fire to and massive fire simulations with more accurate tracking of the outflows. And he is computing not only the mass loading um, scalings, which have been presented before, for example, in Murotov et al., but also energy, momentum, and metal loading scalings uh, for this material. And I think in the interest of time, I'm going to have to skip um, his interesting results. These are not published yet, but I think that they should be out very soon. Uh, because I just wanted to briefly touch on, um, and really just at the like one slide advertisement level, a few of the other um, interesting first results from smog that were in our paper splash from last June. Um, so one is a paper led by Miao Li, uh, which also involved Eve, in which she studied the impact of type one supernovae in quiescent galaxies and found that they can um, have a significant role in the development of a multi-phase ISM. And so she studied the energy evolution and turbulent structure of the gas in these ideal, idealized simulations. This process is of course typically not included or resolved at all in cosmological simulations, but her work provides us with now a framework to try to do that. And then a work by, uh, led by Bhavna Motvani, a graduate student at Columbia with an affiliation at the CCA. So what she did <clears throat> was to take galaxies in the illustrious TNG simulation and look at roughly kiloparsec scale pixels. So the idea is that these are pixels sort of like the tall box Tigris simulations, but now this is a cosmological simulation. So we can do this for galaxies over many different masses over all of cosmic time. This, this sort of touches on Sukanya's question of what is the full set of initial conditions that you need to probe with these resolved simulations in order to study the conditions where stars might form in galaxies across all of cosmic time and all different kinds of populations of galaxies. So this is the first stab at this using the illustrious TNG simulations. So the, the main parameters are the gas surface density, stellar surface density, gas metallicity, star formation rate surface density, velocal, vertical velocity dispersion, and epicyclic frequency. Um, and so that's what this big corner plot is showing for these kiloparsec scale patches of galaxies. And so the interesting thing is that there's significant redundancy. There's sort of a manifold in this high dimensional space that galaxy pieces live along. And again, this comes back to uh, my introduction and the idea of these sort of high dimensional resolved scaling relations that, that galaxies follow. So this is actually great, right? Because it means we don't have to do Latin hypercube sampling or something in this um, high dimensional space. Presumably we can sample along these manifolds. And in fact, using a PCA analysis, Pavna found that a three dimensional representation can capture most of the information in, in this distribution. Okay. Um, and then lastly, uh, this is a, a project led by Daniel Anglas Alcazar, touching on the other piece of SMAUG, which I'm personally very um, interested in, but uh, is in some ways an even harder problem. And that is how supermassive black holes form and grow and affect galaxies and their surroundings. So what Daniel did was to use the FIRE2 zoom-in simulations as a starting point and, and then do what he calls a hyper refinement um, where he in, decreases the masses of particles as he goes closer and closer to the black hole. So you can see these sort of zooms within zooms here going from the full fire to zoom all the way down to scales of, of 10, parsec, 10 parsecs to structures that are starting to be close to uh, the scales of what might be feeding accretion onto supermassive black holes. And we track the black hole accretion via explicit capture. So there's no subgrid recipe here. And we can test, for example, how well things like the Bondi, Hoyle, a, you know, commonly used accretion model work, which is not well at all, um, as well as other proposed subgrid accretion models. And then the last thing I want to mention uh, at the advertisement level is a sort of a, a sister project or spin-off from Smaug, which has itself, I think, become a very exciting project. Um, so this was really led uh, and conceived 
by Paco Velasquez and Navarro, who's at Princeton now, Shai Genel and, and Daniel Angos Alcazar, both associate research scientists at CCA. Um, so what they've done, it, it's, it's truly amazing, really. They've run literally thousands, um, we're up to over 4,000 at current count, of different variations of simulations with full n-body and hydro using uh, the illustrious TNG physics in the Arepo code and the Simba physics in the Gizmo code. And so they vary everything. They vary cosmological parameters. They vary the parameters that control stellar feedback, stellar driven winds and AGN feedback. So they've kind of done this brute force sampling um, of this parameter space. And the goal is really to see whether we can design machine learning techniques to do emulation so to go from dark matter to galaxy properties using machine learning rather than having to run a hydro simulation or to actually learn uh, things like cosmological parameters from the simulations that include baryonic physics. So essentially to ask the machine to do the marginalization problem. And there are something like 20 projects now going on uh, within the CAMELS collaboration involving many, many students from Princeton and elsewhere. Um, and the first paper should be out any time. I think I'm probably the one holding it up at this point by not sending Paco my comments. So, uh, so look out for this. And since we're running a bit on the late side, let me just leave my summary slide up here and, and take any further questions. Thank you for an interesting talk. Um, any question from the audience? Yeah, uh, Renya, go ahead. And nice talk, Rachel. So I have a question. Yes. Um, this multi-scale approach appears to be a bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Yes, that's correct. And then um, gas formation and you know IG and all these interactions, at least initially, is a top-down process in the sense that, that you get gas coming in and the form or structures driving star formation. Do you think the other direction might be important? The other direction is definitely important and it's exactly that connection that we want to study by building this ladder. So of course we have to study, you know, these bottom up processes in the context of the full cosmological framework. So that's, that is exactly the inter interaction we eventually want to study, but it takes a while to build up to that point. So that may be why it seems like um, that hasn't been the focus. But for example, the, the work that Viraj Pandya has been doing with fire has shown that that's critical, right? So the, the rate that gas is flowing in, we might think that we understand that, but that's actually itself a hard problem. Yeah, I mean, in, in more detail, you know, whatever you have one kilopascal cube, pixels that you pick, you got many, many of these in a larger scale cosmological simulation. But the, uh, how each of these pixels get there depends on what happened on small scales in the first place yes. and the odd two-way interactions. I agree. Thank you. Next question from Netta. Yeah. Hi, Oicho. Thank you Hi. for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Uh, I was trying to understand what you said about the, the gas to dark matter relations for the dwarf galaxies. You had mm -hmm. one of the previous plots showing the inflow, the ratio of the gas to the dark matter, and it's dependent on the mass. So, yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So, it's, it's, so what's ha I'm trying to understand what's happening there. So, the, you have the, the ratio of gas to dark matter net is much lower for dwarfs, but early on, they did fall in the same baryonic, uh, cosmic baryon fraction. It's just that you have more feedback that pushes the gas out for the dwarfs? So what we think is happening is that um, these winds deposit not only kinetic energy, but also thermal energy. And that can actually heat the gas and prevent, and this is happening at the scale of the halo virial radius. So it's not really obvious that, that, that this would be effective. But this is what we see in these simulations, may not be true, um, that that can actually prevent gas from accreting 
into these halos, even, you know, even up to scales of 10 to the 11, which are sort of more massive halos than, than you might think. And I, right. I see a dependence, if that's the case, I see a dependence on redshift, on redshift. so higher mm -hmm. redshift, you have much more gas that could fall in uh, because it's not hot enough and it's not preventing additional gas or? Well, the gas is also denser at high redshift. And so it, it may be able to cool more, more efficiently. So if I try to think about it just uh, conceptually, if you go to much higher redshift, what's it 10? What would you expect to see there? Just physically, physics wise. Mm -hmm. I would expect to maybe see more efficient inflows because the gas is denser. On the other hand, it's also lower metallicity. So the cooling may be a little bit lower, but I think the density effect wins because it goes as density squared. Um, the feedback may be weaker. There may be less efficient star formation because of the lower metallicity. But again, all of these processes, it's hard to guess the answer, right? Because these are all very non-linearly interacting processes. Right. So you kind of have to put the physics all together and, and really see what happens. Um, but that's, that's an extremely interesting question. And it's actually the topic of the brief presentation that I'll give at, at lunch today. Oh, good. Sort of what will happen at much higher redshift. Good, because what I think is if you go to very high redshift to the initial formation, it should be about one. I mean, it should be the, the yes. cosmic baryon fraction. They just fall in by gravity. Or maybe closer to one, yeah. Closer, yep. closer to one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great question, thank you. Uh, our last question from Sukanya. Um, thanks for a great talk, Rachel. I wanted to ask, are these um, pure hydro simulations? Because I can imagine one of the advantages of the, the bottom up approach that you have is to, for example, look at the effects of magnetic fields on star formation and the wind launching mechanism. Is that being done? So the Tigris simulations are MHD. Um, and Chenggu and Eve have shown that the magnetic pressure does not seem to be dominant in, in driving winds. However, uh, they do not yet include cosmic rays. And so that's, of course, a very uh, a topic of great interest and we think may be very important for understanding the dynamics of these winds. And so you should ask um, Tengu and Eve and, and their group. I know that they've been working on this very hard, uh, but you should ask them what this The cosmological simulations that we work with, so there is uh, idealized MHD within a repo, so it's you know, has its limitations, but we, we, we do to some extent include the MHD. All right, um, so this is about noon. I think uh, we can finish here. Thank you, Rachel, again for the wonderful talk. Um, in about half an hour, we're going to have a call lunch and Rachel will join us again and tell us more about her work. So please make sure to come back, uh, not to this link, to a different link. Uh, check your email. Okay. Um, see everybody soon. Thanks, everybody.